Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Get Well Be show and podcast. I am thrilled to have my guest today. Uh, Sarah Hornsby is a dental hygienist who specializes in something called myofunctional therapy, which we'll talk a lot more about today. She's the founder of two companies, Faceology, which is for patients seeking this myofunctional therapy. It's a virtual clinic. And then also Myo Mentor, which is to spread the gospel of this work to help other health professionals use it and understand it. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, like you said, spread the gospel and um, share more about this field because it's a really, I think, under appreciated and uh, not very well-known field that could actually help and impact so many people if they just knew about it. So this is helping it uh, get out there. So thank you. Great. Well, I'm happy to help you spread the gospel. Um, so I'll just give a little background to the Welby community about you know why you're on the show and what sparked my interest in myofunctional therapy. Some People might remember Hannah Bronfman uh, gave an interview for Welby about her experience with infertility and how she had this big uh, bike accident. Her teeth got knocked out and she discovered that she had some stealth infections in her gum, you know, and had to have something called cavitation surgery to have them cleaned out. And, you know, a couple of months after the surgery was able to get pregnant. This was pretty amazing to me. And also I've had some family members and private clients lately going through similar things with having stealth infection due to jaw surgeries or other accidents in their mouth and not knowing about it and having a lot of unexplained chronic health issues over time and really seeing the connection between self-infections in the mouth and chronic health issues that won't go away. So then as I learned more about that topic, I started to learn about really the strong connection between breath, ability to breathe properly, especially when sne- sleeping and sleep, and then either healing a chronic health issue, or if you're not able to breathe properly, having one or several develop over many years of not sleeping properly. Um, and so I started to learn about this and how, you know, tongue ties come into it and, and proper breathing positioning and stuff. And I just thought it was so interesting. And then I learned about Sarah and her work with myofunctional therapy and wanted her to share more about it on the show. So that's the background. Sarah, <laughs> tell us about what myofunctional therapy is and how you got into the field. Yeah, no, I love your your background story. So myofunctional therapy is really easy to visualize and, and understand if you think about physical therapy. So it's basically exercises for your tongue, your lips, your mouth, your breathing, um, the muscles of your head, neck area, pretty much. But a lot of the therapy is focused on the tongue. So um, that's, I mean, really what we do. We teach people exercises and the exercises have four very simple goals. So the number one goal for all of our patients is that you have to breathe through your nose all day and all night. That's critical. Number two, you have to have your tongue in the roof of your mouth, which I encourage everyone as they're listening to this or watching the video, think about where your tongue is sitting right now, because it should be up in the top. And that means your full tongue, the tip, the middle and the back has to be touching the roof of your mouth. So, and that's day and night. Okay. The third goal is that your lips are together, which is really the same thing, but it's just, you know, we do focus on the lips versus the tongue. And then um, the fourth goal is swallowing correctly. So once all the postures are in place, then we focus on the swallow. Um, there's a whole bunch more I could explain about that, but I mean, really the, the goals of the therapy are very, very simple. And in reality, you should not need a therapist to teach you these things. These are things that we should be doing naturally and innately from the day we're born. And uh, so if we're not, then we have to start asking, what are these underlying issues? What's causing us to mouth breathe or what's causing our tongue to be in the wrong place? And that's really, I think, powerful. It's so simple, but it lays the foundation for so many other things that you want to talk about, like sleep. And um, a lot of my patients I work with have TMJ issues. Yeah. Chronic illnesses. There, there's so many paths that you can go down once you have that foundation of breathing and tongue posture. So yeah, we can, we can open up from there. If you want to know how I got into this, that's a different topic. Um, I'm a dental hygienist originally, and about 12 years ago, I needed CE 
I ended up taking a class on this topic and was blown away by the fact that I had never heard of it. And I was a new graduate from dental hygiene school. And I thought I went to a great school. I've got a bachelor's degree. You know, I should know everything. Uh, I should be on the top of my game. And I had never heard of this field. And then at the same time, I was sitting there in the class realizing that I had some of the symptoms and I did not understand why, like I said, I went to a good school. I was a new graduate, should have like the best, latest and greatest information out there. And I had never heard of this topic and no one had ever told me that I had these symptoms. So it was really kind of that personal journey and that connection and that almost like a fog was lifted or something where I thought, wait a minute, if I have this and I'm a dental hygienist, a professional, then you know, what's, what's going on here. And so it led me to ask a lot more questions and here we are today. So <laughs> that's awesome. Well, all of my favorite <laughs> interviews are with people who decided to follow questions they had <laughs> and almost all of us had a personal experience that brought us to the work that we do in this yeah. space. So you're in good company. Tell me what are some risk factors or clues um, prior to someone having symptoms that may indicate future issues with breathing or tongue placement, tongue mobility, like, you know, what you mentioned, you had some of the symptoms. Um, what were those? And like, what are the most common things that people are experiencing who then need? Yeah, it's, it's interesting um, because our, our symptoms that we look for are also those goals we're trying to change. So I was in that class realizing that um, my tongue was in the bottom of my mouth and I kind of thought, well, you know, why have I never heard about tongue posture? And so I was sitting there thinking my tongue's in the bottom of my mouth. And then the more I tried to keep my lips together and nasal breathe, you know, consistently, which, you know, the, the mouth breathing topic, nobody, no one on earth wants to admit that they're actually mouth breathing. And, you know, it takes a lot of self-awareness to be able to realize that you're even doing it. And so most patients that come to our practice, um, they, have either had this discovery or someone's pointed it out to them, or they might still kind of be in denial that they're even doing it. Um, mouth breathing is the root cause of all sleep disordered breathing, which we're just starting to understand in sleep dentistry and sleep medicine that the children who start off mouth breathing are the adults who end up with sleep apnea. And there's this, this um, spectrum that starts with mouth breathing. It leads to something called upper airway resistance syndrome, which then leads to snoring, which then leads to mild sleep apnea, moderate sleep apnea, severe sleep apnea. But it all starts in this very bottom, you know, end of the, I guess, I guess line um, with just mouth breathing. And so if you can correct it at just mouth breathing, it will never progress to these worse symptoms. However, if you already notice that you're snoring, or you already noticed that you're feeling sleepy or that you're really restless, you're waking up multiple times a night, maybe you already have some form of sleep disordered breathing, then if you can go back to the beginning of where it all started and correct the mouth breathing, you can improve these downstream symptoms. And so you kind of can look at it in both directions. Like, okay, am I mouth breathing day or night? Is my tongue in the top or bottom of my mouth? Uh, you mentioned tongue tie, which is a big part of not being able to keep your tongue up, we have to start asking why. Um, and, and we have to start asking why when it comes to just mouth breathing. And so you can look at other things, you know, what causes mouth breathing allergies, you know, if you're chronically congested, if you're a child and you have giant tonsils and adenoids, um, even asthma, any type of breathing issue will lead to mouth breathing, which will then set you down these different, you know, sleep disordered breathing paths. So uh, I know that's like a lot of topics I just talked about. So hopefully that kind of helps connect some of those dots though, because what we're treating is so simple. It's the bottom of the, you know, it's like the bottom of the pyramid, but then, like I said, the downstream effects of treating those things uh, can really uh, help in, in the bigger picture. So, so let's, you just said you, you mentioned a lot of different topics um, that are mm -hmm. all worthy of, because <laughs> I think people are like, wait, 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 wait. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's go back. Um, so first off, what are the things besides allergies that you've seen that actually cause mouth breathing, you know, combination mm -hmm. of structural and, uh, you know, yeah, we, we actually, I, I like your words. There's structure and function and behavior. We kind of talk about that in, in the therapy process. So the structure is 
you know, you're chronically congested or you have a deviated septum or you have, like I said, the large tonsils and adenoids um, in adults, they can have like nasal polyps. There can be something structurally, physically wrong. And the way you can kind of eliminate that, the way that we talk about it in, in the field that I teach is a three minute lip seal test. So can you breathe through your nose for three minutes straight? 97% of people, 98% of people should be able to do that. There's, you know, the two to 3% of people who can't should probably go straight to the ENT and get the structures checked out. Um, the function is just practicing it. <laughs> it's really interesting because with nasal breathing, it actually feels really uncomfortable when you're not used to it. And there's a whole complex reasoning for that. But if you're used to even 50, 50 mouth versus nose breathing, you can have completely clear structures, but, um, because extra CO2 is accumulating in your body, but because of nasal breathing, you feel this urge to want to breathe and you feel like you can't breathe. And so it feels kind of stressful. And so it takes three to four weeks of consistent nasal breathing to get past that. Um, but that would be addressing the kind of the function. And the behavior is just remembering, you know, we, we get habits. If you were a child with a lot of allergies and breathing issues, and then those allergies and breathing issues go away, you can oftentimes have the behavioral habits of mouth breathing left behind as an adult. And you don't actually have any structural or functional problems. You just don't think about it. You know, uh, it's not something that's at the front of your mind. Like, oh, I need to breathe through my nose, not my mouth because you spent, you know, 10 years of your childhood doing that. So it just is a habit that kind of stayed with you. So that was just, you know, the, the breathing side. Um, asthma is a tricky one. Asthma feels like you can't take a deep breath. It doesn't have to do with like a nose issue. It just, it feels uncomfortable. It feels like you're not able to get oxygen. So people with uh, asthma tend to be mouth breathers. And again, then it leads down those other pathways. Got it. Okay. And what are, if, if any, like the, you know, root causes of tongue ties, um, because mm. I, you know, just had my first child 18 months ago and I'd really never heard about tongue ties until having a baby. And then it seemed to come out mm. of everybody's mouth. Like, you know, as soon as my son wasn't mm. latching that well, I was like, Oh, tongue tie. Or I took him to his first baby chiropractic appointment Aww. and I'm you know, they want to like, everybody wants to look for that. He did not end up having one, but I have had several friends who said, you know, that was like instant nursing fix, like mm -hmm. trouble with nursing, tongue tie corrected, they could nurse. So um, mm -hmm. it's definitely something I've started to wonder about. And are there any root causes? So this is a, a really, it's a big topic of discussion in, in our field. And even in the time that I've been doing this since 2010, um, the conversation around tongue tie has dramatically ramped up pretty much since 2017. We had a, a, a study published that came up with a new grading system and, and really talked more about tongue tie in adults. And I would say since around 2017, 2018, it's just so, so much has changed. So it used to kind of be something that a lot of people didn't understand. They denied was even there. You know, you can go to your pediatrician or your dentist and they're like, oh, you're fine. Now I think there is a significant amount of research connecting tongue tie to sleep apnea. And um, going back to, you know, what, le what leads to mouth breathing, tongue tie can actually lead to mouth breathing. So it kind of creates this, if you can't get your tongue up, then your mouth stays open. So you mouth breathe. So it is also one of the root causes. We don't actually know, and there's a lot of people with a lot of theories around why are we seeing so many tongue ties? There's one theory where people talk about, you know, back in the old days, we didn't have bottles, you know, we're talking like, you know, babies with, who were tongue tied wouldn't have survived. And so, you know, now we have ways of managing and, you know, we're not, it's not a survival situation, but it would have been several hundred, you know, definitely thousands of years ago. Um, there's old literature and, and documents talking about midwives having like a sharp, extra long pinky fingernail and swiping under newborns tongues to, to release so that they could latch. I mean, because back in the old days, all you could do was breastfeed. We didn't have formula. We didn't have bottles. We didn't have these modern things to help. So uh, there are some epigenetic changes that have happened that are pretty well documented through books like Breath. There's another book called Jaws talking about even in the past two to 300 years, changes in our jaws and skulls are significantly different than people, you know, 
not like our ancient ancestors, people only two, three, 400 years ago. Um, so, you know, we're talking about pretty much since the industrial revolution, people have had softer food, our diets have changed. That's also right around the time when women started going and working, um, not so much in cottage industry, but in factories, and they were um, not able to breastfeed, so they were bottle feeding. So they're talking about changes with bottle feeding, changes with more pollution, toxins, breathing challenges in the air, uh, softer foods, so people are not chewing so much. And so our jaws and, and faces are changing and um, our function is changing. And so it's really interesting. And so a lot of people say, oh, well, there's more tongue ties now because of these other epigenetic changes that have been taking place over about seven or eight generations of people. And now we're just at this, like almost the majority of the population has these problems because it's been passed down for, you know, seven or eight generations now since we've started having all these modern changes. So I don't know. Uh, there's another theory that says, well, it's always been like that. We're just noticing it now, which I don't really think is true because again, if this many tongue-tied babies existed a thousand years ago, they <laughs> just they wouldn't they wouldn't survive. So it's a very interesting topic, and I don't have the answer, but those are what people talk about. So, well, those are all fantastic food for thought, even if they're not <laughs> the answer. But I think all of them are yeah. great theories. And uh, <laughs> I remember reading that book, um, *Sapiens*, with lots of great explanations for dietary changes over time mm -hmm. from, you know, when we were nomadic and then mm -hmm. when we were farming and mm -hmm. um, how that has physically changed us as well, which is so, yeah, it's so and, fascinating, you know, even yeah. just, I, and I know this plays into your work as well, but like posture people's posture mm -hmm. from desk work, which is very new in the history of civilization is going to dramatically change our oh, skeletal yeah. structure. So a thousand years from now, they'll be looking at us and we're so different from the people <laughs> yeah. 15 miles a day foraging and yeah. moving from place to place to follow. For sure. Calls and I'll, stuff. I'll, um, I'll share those books so that you can link them. But um, like I said, breath and jaws, and there's a few others. I mean, it started with the work of um, Weston Price and there's another guy before him, George Catlin, I believe. And um, they just talk about, the changes of people's jaws, skulls, faces, diets, and all that stuff, and how that affects us today. So it's, it is really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it makes you both appreciate modern technology that these kids can survive, but then also like, okay, well, if we're doing all these things that they're being born with this not so great, should we just go back to how they were doing I know. before all the tongue ties started? And then I wonder, you know, it's taken, like I said, seven or eight generations to get us to this point will it take that many generations to undo a lot of that stuff? And how would that even be possible? You know? So I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. From what I've seen, I'm not sure we're going to be going in the right direction anytime soon, <laughs> even with the awareness that you're spreading right now. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> so, okay. So that's tongue ties and mouth breathing. Um, I have pe many people close to me who are mouth breathers, but I'm not sure that they, you know, that it's really manifested in some serious symptoms. So mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously the symptom of mouth breathing is mm -hmm. that you can't breathe, you know, breathe through your nose, but then yeah. downstream, what does that do to your sleep and what chronic diseases or symptoms do you see most commonly come from the sleep issues or the mouth breathing? Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a really big topic. Um, I talk a lot about research because I, I teach this stuff and, you know, when you're teaching doctors and hygienists and speech pathologists and healthcare professionals, they want to know you know, is this evidence-based? Is this real? And so I, I do try to, to reference oh, this, as much as I can. This well-being community is very interested in research. So the more <laughs> okay. research you have, the better. <laughs> okay. So there's an article and I can share it with you. I cannot remember the name, but it was um, a a 10,000 kids and it was just published in 2021. And what they're realizing is that just mouth breathing, and we're not even talking obstructive sleep apnea, which we know is at that bad end of the scale and some kids can have it just mouth breathing and noisy breathing and kind of breathing resistance at night changes the gray matter of the brain. And so it doesn't even have to be full to snoring yet, but it, it changes the brain. And the way we see it in children is um, ADHD, ADD, trouble focusing. So the symptoms of what you know we see as ADD overlap a ton, almost 100% with the symptoms of kids who have sleep disordered breathing. And so 
they get hyperactive because they're exhausted. Um, they can't focus on anything because they're exhausted. They're not sleeping well because they're not breathing well. And so if even if you Google it, like WebMD has some pretty, like they'll even say mouth breathing is a risk factor for ADD, you know? And I'm like, okay, we, we talk about these risk factors and kids with, with breathing issues have ADD, but we don't talk about addressing those breathing issues to help the ADD. So you know, we're, we're getting there. At least the awareness is growing. We have tons of research connecting ADD and sleep disorder breathing and hyperactivity and all these things in kids. In adults, there is legitimate research being done around Alzheimer's and dementia and the long-term effects of having these breathing issues at night. The interesting thing is we, we think it has to be so extreme, like severe obstructive sleep apnea. Um, but again, we're seeing changes in the brain and changes in even you can feel it in your sleep with just breathing through your nose versus breathing through your mouth. So I don't know if your listeners are, have ever heard, or if you've ever heard of mouth taping, it's becoming a whole thing online. And, and I know from my own personal experience, I never would have said I was a bad sleeper. Um, luckily I discovered that I was, you know, quote unquote mouth breathing, which again, I was, but I would say I was maybe 50, 50, you know? So it's not like I was just walking around kind of the stereotypical, like Napoleon dynamite look, you know, mouth gaping open. Like that's pretty rare. That's like the extreme, extreme mouth breathing situation. Most adults will, will nasal breathe pretty consistently. Then they'll take a couple of breaths through their mouth and then they'll nasal breathe and their mouth breathe. And they're kind of going back and forth, but <laughs> just nasal breathing at night. If you tape your lips together, you will feel so much more refreshed and you will have slept better just by putting some tape on your mouth and breathing through your nose all night. And so just knowing that, I think, yes, there's all this like brain stuff going on, but even just feeling better, I think for most people, it's like worth trying to switch from that mouth breathing at night to nose breathing at night. That's great. I mean, you, you had me at ADHD and ADV and mouth breathing because the people I'm thinking of, I think suffer from both. Yeah don't know oh, the connection yeah. so that was fascinating <laughs> for me it was like and there's a thing. lot of research on it so if you like research I mean I can send you so many articles I'm, I'm just like why is this not like mainstream yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean the amount be... of research that has been linked back to AD and ADHD just with even food dyes or yeah. now the mm -hmm. mouth breathing and that it's somehow not part of the conversation when a kid gets diagnosed with these things yeah. just I know. blows my mind but me too you know, it's but I mean, it's so common. People don't like even my husband who knows all this stuff. He knows what I do. He's like, he's almost an expert because he hears me talk about it so much. He was, you know, a Ritalin kid of the nineties. He was totally, he's like, I was medicated my whole childhood. Um, and he, uh, he's like, he's tongue tied. He snores. He's a super restless sleeper. And I'm like, you were one of your, you know, like, I know your history. I know where you are today. And, and he just kind of, you know, he, he still is like, no, I'm fine. And, you know, so it's hard to get people to see that their sleep might actually be affected to like their tongue tie and their breathing. And that, oh, that, you know, he had, he ticks all the boxes and, you know, he's, he's like, let's just focus on the kids first. And he's like, you can deal with me later, but you know, it's always our closest family that was like, <laughs> are the hardest. Oh, absolutely. So. Yes. I have many more stories, just like the one you shared with all yeah. of my family members but and myself you sometimes, you know, yeah, and, and you can see it. So if you do look back in someone's history and they had signs of allergies and asthma and ADD and, you know, nasal congestion and, uh, you know, there's so many other things even, um, digestive issues can relate back to it, which is a whole nother topic. <laughs> um, but you know, if you see these things and then you look in someone's mouth today and they're tongue tied and they tell you that they have bad sleep, then yes, there's, there's some, you know, some topics here that we can talk about and definitely help with. So it's, at least it's a, a more, I don't want to say easy. It's a simple, um, thing to do, but, uh, anything that requires changing habits is hard. So any therapy is going to be more difficult than taking a pill or having a surgery. So, you know, it's, it also is helping people understand that, that bigger picture and that it requires work and effort. And it's, there's, you know, it's not a magic wand. So, <laughs> yeah. So I do want to get into the therapy component because like anything, I think people, love to have their eyes open to something, but then want to know what they can do about it if they believe they have it or a family member has it. So we'll get into all that in a second. But first, because, you know, I work with people who have had kind of 
long-term chronic conditions or, you know, mystery illnesses where like Mm -hmm. they have a lot of different things wrong. They can't really figure out the root cause or many conventional doctors have told them very kind of BS conditions, right? Like Mm -hmm. um, IBS, which means Mm -hmm. nothing. What is irritating your bowel or fibromyalgia, which means nothing. What is causing Mm -hmm. pain or Mm -hmm. even long-term Lyme or long-term COVID. Yeah. But why is it long-term? My immune system should have kicked it, right? Like yeah, I don't have a stronger case of COVID. I just can't kick it. So what's going on in my body? You know, that kind of thing. So, and then of course, a lot of like autoimmune things. Why is my own body attacking itself? It shouldn't be doing yeah. that. So there's a lot of people in the well being community that have these issues or are interested in these issues. And I'm curious how poor sleep over many years and mouth breathing, um, there's clearly good research connecting it to ADD and ADHD and then Alzheimer's and dementia and, and, you know, conditions of the brain. Mm -hmm. But what about the ability for your immune system to heal other things? How is, what's the connection there? So the connection has to do with our, our stages of sleep. So I kind of, when I talk about it, I'm always like trying to simplify and make easy concepts. And so it's kind of my, my nature, but I talk about um, REM is for the brain. And so if you're not getting REM sleep, then that's where you'll kind of feel like you're forgetful, brain foggy, stuff like that. Um, When you're not getting into stage three and stage four deep sleep, that's where it affects your body. And I think the biggest way that not getting enough deep sleep affects your body is through hormones. So all of our hormones are released, produced, regulated. Um, So much of our hormone function happens at night in those deep stages of sleep. There is quite a bit of research around growth hormone and mouth breathing and growth hormone and sleep disorder breathing in kids. And so the kids who mouth breathe or don't breathe well at night, a lot of times are smaller, thinner. And then there's lots of of evidence of when these kids start, you know, they get their tonsils out or they start doing myofunctional therapy. They grow several inches because all of a sudden they're sleeping better, their hormone functions back on track. And so it's a great analogy for what other hormones (laughs) are being affected. And so with, I hear uh, hypothyroidism um, connected a lot. And I I just saw a study on thyroid function and sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing. And so, but honestly, I mean, any hormone, because like I said, at night in those deep stages of sleep, that's when our hormone and immune and our whole body function is repairing and regulating. And so if we're not getting the deep sleep um, or it's very interrupted, that's, that's where a lot of these chronic illnesses I think um, are really stemming from. Yeah. I mean, even just someone listening to this quite simply think about when you've ever been sick, right. And you just need to sleep like a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, your body goes into repair mode when you're asleep. (laughs) So acutely, if you've had a stomach virus or a cold, right. And you just Mm -hmm. sleep and you're able to, you're at a, you know, you have the kind of life where you could just pause where you could sleep for 36 hours or a lot over two or three days. You're going to kick that so much faster. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, a really demanding work schedule that week and small children and whatever. And like, you can't give yourself more sleep. You kind of have like a call for weeks, right? Like it just doesn't, leave. And it's because of this connection between immune system repair and sleep. And so think about like all those little repairs that would be happening over time to your immune system and your body that you're not getting. And so, yeah, it kind of just piles up decades, (laughs) right? Like you're bound to develop chronic health issues from it. So yeah, for sure. I mean, if you, if you don't breathe well and you don't sleep well for decades, the, the, ramifications of that. I mean, it, it's not, it's not good. You're just going <laughs> to really be collecting symptoms, right? I mean, yeah. there's going to be so many different ones. Yeah, no. completely. Okay, great. Well, thank you for allowing people to see the connection between something that seems yeah. very physical and then relating it to all these other things that aren't. Well, that's, that's kind of what I like about the topic is like, mouth breathing, it sounds so simple and like almost dumb, like who cares, you know, but when you realize that there's so many bigger implications of it, then it also is empowering to know that, oh, all I have to do is switch my breathing and I can have this amazing ripple effect in all these other areas. Like, okay, I'll I'll do that. You know, it makes sense. It's an easy, um, you don't even need a therapist to help you with that. You can do a lot on your own. So 
Yeah, that's great. Um, so speaking of what you can do on your own, I know you have sort of a simple self-assessment that the well community or whoever's listening to this um, can do to determine if they're sleeping effectively or efficiently or both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so on our website, um, we put together just a little questionnaire. Uh, I think we're always trying to find ways to give information and to help people do things on their own, but then also say, okay, we're here when you need us and if you need us and when you're ready, because obviously there's it's a whole different level. Um, and, and probably for you as well, Adrian, when there's a lot of stuff that people want to do on their own, but then at some point they get ready and they're like, okay, I need professional help. So the self-assessment that we have on our website is really just to help people kind of see where they are. So we grade their symptoms of mild, moderate, or severe. I believe there's like 10 questions. I'd have to look at it. And uh, it's it's more of like a myofunctional screening form, although a lot of the questions are related to sleep. It's pretty much impossible to talk about myofunctional therapy without the sleep issues because they are one in the same. Um, they really go hand in hand. And so, like I was saying, the kids who mouth breathe are the adults with sleep apnea. Um, the kids who are tongue tied, the kids who have any myofunctional problem, which starts with breastfeeding, <laughs> you know, uh, that's when we see a lot of it um, with tongue ties and stuff. So these myofunctional symptoms don't go away unless they're addressed. So that's how you can end up as a 50 year old person with a tongue tie and these myofunctional issues. And if, if you have myofunctional issues at 50, you definitely probably have some sleep issues as well. So they, they are one in the same thing. It's just further down the spectrum. Right. And like the actual term myofunctional means what? So myo is muscle and then functional. So the technical word that we should all be using in the field is just so long is orofacial myofunctional. So it should be like mouth, face, muscle function problems. Okay. Got it. <laughs> so, but it's just a mouthful. Because- so in the field, we shorten it. We'll say myo. We say OMT, which is like an abbreviation, oral facial myofunctional therapy. We shorten it to just myofunctional because it's just, I think we have kind of a branding issue. <laughs> it's like such a I hard word. Say, as soon as you <laughs> use a term that people kind of don't use regularly, they sometimes get shut off and just like, yeah. I don't oh, know yeah. what that is, but it sounds sciencey and intimidating. And yeah, I want exactly. to that it's not actually that. Okay. So I have another question for you. What is the difference between mouth breathing, upper airway resistance syndrome, which you talked about, and then also sleep apnea? Because hmm. to me, it's like, how could you have sleep apnea without having mouth breathing? Like, aren't they always sort of the same? Yeah. So like I said, it starts with mouth breathing. And then if you don't correct mouth breathing, it will progress to um, upper airway resistance syndrome, which is a diagnosis. It's a medical you know, condition that you can be told that you have. And all that is, is you have restriction to your breathing. And the, the interesting thing about UARS, as it's called in the field, is it has the same effects and impacts people the same way that true obstructive sleep apnea does. There's just no obstruction happening. So if someone with UARS goes and takes a sleep study, they don't have losses in oxygen and they don't have um, obstructions. So they will be told by the mainstream medical system that they're quote unquote fine and that something else. But really they're having these breathing issues that what's actually happening is it's causing their body to go into distress fight or flight mode. So our brains are very smart (laughs) and they're supposed to keep us alive at night while we sleep. And so what happens is our brains in this more sensitive level of sleep disordered breathing, our brains are on high alert. And so before we're even able to obstruct or have losses in oxygen when we're sleeping, because of this breathing restriction that we're having, our body gives us a rush of adrenaline, wakes us up. And so the problem for people with UARS is one, they don't get diagnosed. They're told they're fine most of the time. And so they're like, I'm sleeping horribly, but it doesn't show up on a sleep study. These people tend to say they're light sleepers. They tend to be younger. They tend to be thinner. They tend to be fit, healthy looking people like you or me. Like it's actually coined as the um, young fit female version of sleep apnea, because we think of sleep apnea as old, overweight men, which those are the kind of the two stereotypes. And and that's not true. You don't have to be old and overweight or a man, and you don't have to be thin and a woman to have URS. It it can happen to anyone, but that's kind of the two ways of looking at it. So those people are in like fight or flight mode the whole night while they sleep. They don't sleep well because of that. 
Well, at some point, our whatever system and mechanism in the brain that's alerting us and arousing us and causing us to stay awake, our cortical arousability, the technical term, decreases. And that's when people switch. So the brain has become so tired, waking up, waking up, waking up, that now your brain stops doing that. And so it's like, I, I joke, like the brain gets tired. Now you're able to obstruct. So now you have an obstruction. That means your airway closes at night and you're basically holding your breath. And that causes the oxygen levels to drop. We know when someone has progressed to obstructive sleep apnea, because now they have a true obstruction and they have drops in oxygen levels. So diagnosis wise, that's, that's the difference. So just to yeah. make sure I understand <laughs> If you have, you know, mouth breathing or sleep apnea, you might just be like waking up all the time because your body's yeah. like, Hey, we're not getting yeah. enough oxygen. I'm in fight like, flight. I'm right. yeah. I'm not getting enough oxygen. Your body's just alerting you all night. So you wake up feeling exhausted, but you don't necessarily have memory of waking up a lot. It's not like you're, you know, aware of it. You're usually in like stage one sleep, which is where you, you think you're asleep, but you're really not, it's just, you're going to wake up tired and you'll have a lot of the hormone issues. And so um, UIRS is connected with like a lot of the thyroid stuff and, um, but just, just grinding. yeah, URS is more like you've actually now it's like pre sleep like, apnea, like pre true sleep apnea, but it's your body is experiencing the same impact. It's just the diagnosis of getting to that point is not as, as clear cut. So, uh, because you're more in this like hyper arousability, they call it like sympathetic tone. You're in this like state of fight or fight while you sleep, which if you think about it, that's really bad <laughs> you're yeah. in fight flight while you're supposed to be in rest and digest. And that's happening every night, all night. And so um, it's also associated with a lot of clenching and grinding because um, our masseters and clenching are associated with that stress response. And so a lot of people who say, I grind my teeth, I clench my teeth, I wake up with headaches. They overlap significantly with the people who don't sleep well because of this, like they're in fight or flight mode. So that doesn't change. That doesn't like, no one just wakes up with obstructive sleep apnea. You know, they've, they've had to progress from mouth breathing to URS to snoring. And then they get to this worsened stage where now their brain's not alerting them and they're physically having their airway close and get blocked at night, usually from their tongue or soft palate or for overweight people, like the weight of their neck, things like that. So mm -hmm. they're actually stopping breathing. And so if, if you ever heard somebody kind of stop breathing and then wake up and kind of <gasps> gasp for air, they're doing that cycle all through the night, several times per hour. It's actually really disturbing. Severe means that you're having 30 obstructions per hour per night or more. Oh my God. Isn't that crazy? And wow. so, but that means moderate, moderate to severe is 15 to 30. And that means you're still waking up 17 times per hour, obstructing 17 times per hour per night. And that's moderate. <laughs> like that seems Gosh, pretty wow. bad. So um, yeah, it's a really big deal. Was, like our bodies are trying so hard to adapt exactly. in this yes. environment, just like still find a way to kind of sleep. And exactly. Yeah. And that's where kids have a hard time getting the diagnosis too. Um, and, ha and we have to look at kids completely differently because you said that word resilient. Kids are so resilient they will do jumping jacks in their sleep, you know, to not obstruct. And so it's really hard to actually have true sleep apnea as a child, which unfortunately that's what most pediatricians and people are looking for is they're only looking for that obstruction to happen to say, oh, this child has a problem, but there's a lot of problems that they can have before they get to it. If they're actually obstructing as a child, it's really bad <laughs> because they can contort and move and bend and um, do a lot of things before they can get to the point of actually obstructing. So sleep studies don't work great for kids. So we have to look at other signs. Is your child mouth breathing? Do they have restless sleep? Do they have ADD type symptoms? And then we can start saying, okay, let's, let's look at their breathing. Let's treat this stuff. So it's a, right. it's a big topic, but the hard part is it's not how our modern medical and dental system is set up to operate in, which I know you're familiar with that. So in order to fully get this stuff implemented and recognized and, you know, covered by insurance and all these things, it requires a really big paradigm shift in dentistry and in how we treat sleep apnea. So got it. And it on. sounds like I don't, I want to make sure we touch on this because it's a, a very interesting and important uh, topic to my community. And that is gut health and the connection between 
the gut and allergies and food and all this. So I know that there is a connection. You mentioned it briefly between Mm -hmm. allergies and even like constipation and other gut health related things. Yeah. So can you explain that connection? Yeah, there's, there's several connections. So at the most basic level, if you are, I mean, think about when you're, when you're sick and you're really congested and eating is so uncomfortable because you're basically like plugging your nose and trying to chew. And so when you are really not able to breathe well, and you're trying to chew and swallow, and and we see this mostly in kids, uh, you end up taking in a lot of extra air. So gulping in air when you're eating, chewing, swallowing, and that alone, just air, it's called aerophagia swallowing air and having air go into your digestive tract makes you burp and be bloated and gassy. And so just getting people in general to chew and swallow more optimally can actually help just on that level really significantly. And that's so simple. It also starts off the way you swallow. And this is where the vagus nerve is connected and some of the discussions around having a weak swallow and things like that. Chewing and swallowing is the beginning of that like peristalsis type of movement that starts with the swallow and goes down your whole digestive tract. And so if that's, you know, the stage is set with the swallow optimally and and correctly, then it should go better down the whole rest of the the system. It's another connection. Um, Another one is just mouth breathing and your oral microbiome. When you're breathing through your mouth, it changes the flora of the microbiome of your mouth. And so then as you swallow that, it does have an impact on your gut health, the bad sleep and, you know, the inflammation, and I'm sure that affects the gut health, you know, so it's, it's, there's many different levels there, but I think that's pretty much, I mean, when everything is so connected like this, it becomes one of those things where I have to be very clear to, to tell patients. And when I'm teaching this, I always have to be able to say, you know, we're not treating people's gut health. <laughs> we're treating their tongue posture, their lip seal, their nasal breathing. And if we can get those things correct, then let's see what the, what the results are. Let's see if their gut health improves. Let's see if their sleep apnea improves. So, you know, that is where you, you can't, we kind of have to walk the line of what we can promise and what we can kind of say, I've seen this happen. We have research that this can happen, but, uh, <laughs> it is, well, we, know, you know, we know there's many different things that affect the gut. So I yes. see this ca- yeah. you know, caveat is that it's not like all the mouth problem no. is, but is, it makes sense, right? Like if you're having these mouth issues and yeah, it does have a downstream effect on the gut health. And well, it's one, uh, it's one, two, we know that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, one other thing I want to mention, because it's, it's one of my most popular interviews over, you know, the five years or so I've been doing this was a uh, sort of reformed neck and throat surgeon who turned into a, like sort of a holistic ENT. He wrote a book called the acid water diet, Dr. Jonathan Aviv. And I cannot tell you how many people through my site have figured out that they have undiagnosed acid reflux because they never thought of themselves as having actually like heartburn, but they just kind of had like either sleep apnea or chronic cough and things yeah, like they that. call it, um, LPS or silent reflux. It's like yes, lar- exactly. laryngopharyngeal yes, reflux. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there, and he talked about how a lot of people would come to him who had sleep issues and breathing issues. And basically it turned out that, you know, they had, their diets were just like way too acidic. And when they cut out things like, you know, mm-hmm. coffee and alcohol and this and that their sleep improved not because they were drinking so much that it was making them drunk and therefore sleep was affected, but simply because they were so inflamed from the extra acid in their diet, even from like too many crackers or other acidic, you know, (laughs) things, anything in like a box package she talked about was acidic. Um, And so that combination of all those different acidic things in their diets was creating this inflammation that made its way up into your esophagus and like this it's actually yeah i mean it, it actually goes into the mouth and into the nose in a lot of cases it sounds so yeah. disgusting like but stomach pepsin is right. going into the nasal cavity yes. and into the and mouth and we can think they have the chronic teeth. sinus infections yeah. or allergies often yeah. same thing undiagnosed mm-hmm. acid reflux causing these issues so i thought that like my mind was totally blown from that and so this is all yeah. kind of the same tube to me you know it's it like is. Yeah. And there's, there's crossover. Um, Dr. Stephen Park had a whole podcast. I don't know if he's still doing it, but he would talk a lot about the crossover between the acid reflux and the 
LPR, silent reflux, and the sleep disorders. It's never a, if you have silent reflux, then you have a tongue tie. It's not like that direct, but a lot of these myofunctional issues, like the tongue tie and mouth breathing definitely are related to that kind of stuff through the, you know, the sleep apnea stuff as well. So on this, the gut topic, there's something Mm -hmm. about the vagus nerve and the tongue gut connection. Is that different from what we're talking about right now? Not really. I, I don't fully understand it myself, but it has to do with the correct swallow. And I, I did, a, I'm trying to remember her name. I did an interview with someone who um, was talking about the weak swallow and the back of the tongue, and that's innervated by the vagus nerve. And so it, the theory is that if that back portion of the tongue is not working well, or if it's weak, or if you're tongue tied, or if it's not, you don't have the correct like neuromuscular control over it during a swallow, then, you know, that can have an effect on like the vagus nerve. And we know how that, you know, like the brain gut connection is, is there. So I I don't fully understand all the ins and outs of that, but um, I know there are some more expert people in that area than I am that talk about it. And it it is pretty fascinating. So, yeah, well, I, I mean, I kind of get it in that the swallowing is the trigger for your body to start digesting. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you're swallowing is being disrupted by like an improper tongue situation, then <laughs> or, like you could see how that would completely disrupt digestion. Yes. Well, and um, I think the tongue and I shouldn't be, don't quote me on this. I believe the tongue is innervated by three different cranial nerves, which is really interesting. So all those cranial nerves are just so um, influential on like our whole system um, that I think maybe that's where it comes from too. The vagus nerve, we're just learning the most about, but the other cranial nerves are pretty powerful and impactful in a lot of ways too. So um, if you ever want to dive down that rabbit hole, there's a woman um, named Lois Laney. She's actually here in Arizona. I've taken her course and I could not even try to explain it, but she talks all about the cranial nerves and really goes down some interesting pathways with cranial nerve function. So I had no idea it was such a thing until I took her course. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to like take it. Well, that'll that's the next big thing you need to learn about, it sounds like. And generally speaking, I mean, you know, the work that you do, it's a lot of exercises, right? That you have people do at home to try to improve their tongue function. Yeah. I mean, the exercises, like I said, they're they're like you can think of it like physical therapy. Um, one of the big exercises that we we do and that um my partner, Melissa and I, we kind of joke about is uh, we make people click their tongues, you know, so just the, um, the basic like tongue click, I I don't know if zoom will allow it to make the sound, but it looks like just clicking the tongue. That's really, I mean, it's it's funny because it's just like such a simple thing, but she's like, yeah, we're going to go make more people click their tongues. And we kind of joke about how simple it is, but it's actually one of our, our core exercises of getting, you know, getting the ability to suction the tongue and then getting the ability to um, move and elevate the tongue. Again, very simple, but not so easy for everyone, so. So you mentioned it very briefly, but I think when people think of sleep apnea, they think of devices, right? The CPAP, yes. the, like whatever, or even just some sort of like a, almost like a retainer, but then yeah. also the mouth tape. So are those sorts of things also in your practice or are those really the conventional tools and yours are more about exercises? They are the conventional tools. Um, Myofunctional therapy is definitely not conventional, but I think they can be paired to work really well together. So there are some people in my field that are like anti-CPAP machine, but in reality, if a patient progresses to the point where they need a CPAP machine and that's actually helping their quality of life and they're, you know, they've got severe obstructive sleep apnea, I don't want to tell them to not use that, do these exercises instead. Like, I hate to say it, but they're kind of past their way of exercising their way out of it. You know, they're kind of beyond that. (laughs) So um, like the exercises and changing their breathing will help them and it will make their CPAP machine easier to wear. So they're more compliant. So they have better success. But in reality, those people probably need some structural changes to take place as well. So dental wise, we look at like orthodontic expansion or, um, jaw surgery to like move the face forward and, you know, create more space in the mouth and create more space for the tongue and the breathing, but not everyone wants to do that. And so in an ideal, perfect situation, we correct the stuff 
when you're a child. And then we're able to guide the growth and development of your jaws and face by getting your tongue up and nasal breathing. But when we're adults, you know, we've kind of gone through that growth phase of life. So now our structures are more set the way they are. And now we have to, you know, address them potentially with, like you said, that mandibular advancement device, which is really just a appliance that moves the lower jaw forward. There's the CPAP machine that basically just blows air down your throat to stent it open. So you don't obstruct. So these are really great ways of treating the symptoms, but they're definitely not addressing a root cause. Right. Uh, I think there's and definitely a place for them. Remind me what your take is on the mouth taping. Uh, mouth taping, I think is really, it, it can be used in all aspects. So if you're just noticing that you mouth breathe at night and you want to tape, that'll help you. I have patients that are wearing a CPAP machine and they tape their mouth with their CPAP machine. So that way they make sure that they're still nasal breathing, even with their CPAP machine on. So they get better, you know, better effect, better results from it. If you have one of those advancement appliances or some sort of dental device to help you taping with that on can even be more effective. So I think the tape is a good tool, no matter have what. Have you seen the tape provide like a therapy, the way that a exercises would, for example, like if you used it for a couple of months and you were a mouth breather and then you stopped using it, would you go back to mouth breathing or you think it helps train your body to nasal breathe? Uh, it definitely helps train to nasal breathe. It will not train tongue position. Again, I always tell people that if you can do it on your own, you don't need to pay a professional it's all, all the best of luck because that's, you know, <laughs> there are people who can go out and just change habits on their own, you know, but there are people that, you know, they need a personal trainer, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, and I, and I also know that, uh, in my experience, like working with physical therapists, there's just certain nuance nuances that I don't know how to do on my own. So there's a lot of people who can do stuff on their own. And then there's a lot of people I think that just really do need help, but you just need to have your, your tongue up at night. So the tape will help provide the jaw support to get your tongue up. And that's, we use tape in therapy all the time to help with that. And then the tape 100% helps with nasal breathing. So you're getting, you know, at least one of the goals met with the tape, the tongue posture goal still has to be met. And then, um, you know, depending on if you're tongue tied or not, the one thing I will say about tongue tie that I, I want everyone to know to take away is that if you're going to have tongue tie surgery, you need to do exercises before and after, and the doctor that you get the surgery with really matters. So you want to find someone who's experienced, someone preferably if you're an adult who does sutures, who doesn't leave the wound open in like a big, it'll be like a big giant diamond shape. So anyway, I just, some people will go out and listen, say, and think, oh, I'm tongue tied. I'm going to go have that surgery. You want to make sure you have the support with exercises before and after. So anyway, yeah. just throwing that and out also, there. Also, sometimes <laughs> people have like an, a surgery to correct it, right? And other times they just get like a laser or is that the same thing? Same thing. Yeah, oh. just a different tool. So there's some doctors who will use a laser to do the cutting. There's some that'll use like scissors, but either way, they should be suturing the wound closed in adults. In babies, it's totally different. We don't suture babies, but um, for older kids and adults, it just makes the healing so much better. Um, but again, if they're not used to doing that, if they don't normally do it that way, for me and my practice, it's a really big deal finding the doctors who understand the function and aren't just looking at it as a one-time procedure. Like, oh, I can cut anyone's tongue or laser anyone's tongue. I want to know that they're doing it with the goal of proper function. So the reason in, in, in my world that you have a tongue tie surgery is so now you can get your tongue to the roof of your mouth. It's not just to have a surgery, <laughs> right? And so yeah. unfortunately a lot of dentists, they see the freedom and they're like, oh, I can release that. But they're not thinking about function at the end of the, you know, they're just like, oh, I right. can do that. But why, you know, oh, well, we release the tongue. So now you can learn to put it in the roof of your mouth. That's why it should be done in, in, you know, in my world. <laughs> Got so, it. Yeah. Yeah. Function, <laughs> always so important. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been just a fascinating conversation. I can't believe how fast the time has gone because <laughs> I have been so interested in everything you are saying and you are really a wealth of knowledge on this topic. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so remind everybody, you know, where they can go to access your yeah. uh, help if they think they have any of these issues uh, as a patient, but also if they are a health professional who wants to go deeper and, and get yeah, this too. For sure. Um, I'll talk about both. So uh, my practice is called Faceology. The website is myfaceology.com. And that's if you're a patient and you're like, hey, I want to have an evaluation. We've got a team of therapists. Um, I run Faceology with my business partner, Melissa Mugno, who's also 
a wealth of knowledge and an experienced myofunctional therapist. And um, so you can reach out to us through that website. If you are a professional, so a dentist, hygienist, any type of body worker, I mean, we've had chiropractors, we've had so many people with so many backgrounds. If you're a health professional and you want to lactation, about, consult, yeah, right? lactation, exactly. <laughs> if you want to learn about this, um, the website is myomentor.com. That's M Y O M E N T O R. So, and you can also look me up. I have a website, sarahkhornsby.com. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing all of this and being on the show, Sarah. Um, I think it's something that a lot of people deal with and suffer from and don't do anything about, like your husband, for yeah, example. Exactly. Like most of my um, and possibly my <laughs> husband, as we're talking about this. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things where changing the tires on your car, you know, it doesn't seem yeah. like something you want to deal with until you wish you had. And so, because these uh, issues grow slightly over time and or affect you in a way like, let's say, ADHD in a kid, where it affects you, but it's not like going to end your life, right? It's kind of mm -hmm. something you manage. People find a way to manage, you know, they just do and deal, but maybe you don't have to, if you put a little bit of yeah. effort in upfront to either correct a tongue tie, improve tongue placement or correct mouth breathing or, you know, all of the above. So um, I really recommend people to use this as an opportunity to do something about maybe something you've been dealing with a long time or suspect might be an issue, but have just kind of been managing because you could really improve your life without even realizing yeah. that there was a connection between things you were dealing with or that sleep could be better and that you could feel better. Um, or even just to avoid a lot of future pain and suffering through chronic disease in 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, all oh that. God. So with that, thank you again. And I will let you go. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on and Hopefully it was insightful and helpful for all your listeners. I think it certainly was. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.